Well, hello, I'm David Phillips. I'm the senior climatologist with Environment and Climate Change Canada, and I'm ready to start digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe, and I'm on a quest to learn from the best. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one conversations with thoughtful, accomplished, interesting people in many different fields. On this episode, joy, storytelling, and the weather from David Phillips, Senior Climatologist with Environment Canada. So other than hockey, there's probably no more important and more widely discussed topic in Canada than the weather. And David Phillips has been cleverly, creatively, and joyfully sharing stories about the weather for more than half a century. His passion for the subject and his infectious enthusiasm are well known throughout the country. In his role as senior climatologist, David conducts 600 media interviews a year, 600. He's appeared in more than 15,000 newspaper articles about the weather during his career. I myself have interviewed David dozens of times over the past 25 years, and I'll be honest, he's one of my all-time favorite guests because he's such a good communicator And he clearly loves what he does. And really, there's nothing more to being a great guest than that. David is a member of the Order of Canada. He's also the author of three books. And he has produced one of the best-selling calendars in Canadian history, the Canadian Weather Trivia Calendar. But David didn't start out on a path to being a climatologist. He was actually shy and nervous, and he had a different career in mind. In our conversation, we talk about his secret to happiness, about developing your passion, about storytelling, about how carefully he prepares for every speech and interview, why he still hasn't retired after 54 years on the job, and much more. And of course, we talk about his favorite weather stories and the biggest story of his career, climate change. One last thing before we get started, if you like what you hear, please subscribe to Digging Deep and post a review wherever you listen on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere, and share this podcast with your network. And if you're looking for more information about Digging Deep, please go to letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. There you will find my daily blog. You can sign up for my weekly newsletter. You can watch my TEDx talk. Now, let's start digging deep with the Senior Climatologist for Environment Canada, David Phillips. David, it is such a pleasure to welcome you to Digging Deep. Uh, You and I have spoken many times before, I think always over the phone, uh, maybe once or twice in person when you've been uh, touring the country with your calendar. Uh, But this is our first time doing it kind of virtually in this format. So I'm really excited to have you on the show. And I have a huge amount of respect for you and what you do. Um, I always tell people when they ask, Who are some of your your favorite interviews? And I always say David Phillips and Chris Hadfield. So um, that's the company I put you in. So thank you for joining us today. Well, you know, thank you so much, Mark. You know, you're right. We go back a long time. And and this is my first experience on podcasting, which I'm excited by. I always like to try uh, new uh, platforms. But I've always had a high respect for your uh, for you, Mark. I mean, you're always when you talk to me, you're always prepared, you're balanced, you 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 feed off my answers, not give me the next question, and and I think that's uh, that's a real skill. And uh, but and I'm I'm so impressed. I look at the lineup of people you have talked about it to in the last year and a half, and I'm impressed. I'm flattered that you'd include me. But Mark, I have to warn you. I, I'm I think I'm the first bureaucrat or the first uh, government employee that. <laughs> and you know we're we're rather reticent. We're vanilla like. I mean, if we have an opinion, we have to get permission to to utter it, you say. And uh, so I, I think that you might be able to scratch the surface, but I don't think you're going to be able to dig deep for for me. I'm I'm a government employee. <laughs> well, we'll see. I'm going to give okay. it my best, my best shot. Um, okay. And I'm married to a government employee. So okay. uh, <laughs> and, and I, I'm from Ottawa. So, of course, uh, they're all around me. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because we could talk about this a little bit later. You 
you almost have a little bit of a special status as a government employee in a way because you um, because of the long career that you've had uh, and the many, many media interviews you've done. So you're almost in a category by yourself. Well, some people call me sort of Teflon, you know, things. But, you know, Mark, I can tell you, uh, you do as much interviewing as I do. You get in trouble. You make mistakes. You, I always think it's never, I always worry about what's going to come out of my mouth in a particular situation. And so uh, I've had good bosses who have defended me and supported me. And uh, my gosh, it's, uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, I, I, I feel very fortunate in my situation that uh, I can, um, I can speak without getting permission. Mm -hmm. So let's dig into uh, your life story a little bit. When, when you go back to your childhood, what would you say is your fondest childhood memory? Well, Mark, I was born in Windsor, Ontario. I lived in a neighborhood called Riverside. And in front of our street, the road went one way and then the other side went the other way. And there was a boulevard in between. And what I most remember about my childhood were street sports. My gosh, we would go out there and we'd play football in the park in the boulevard or in the uh, inter, uh, uh, during when the, when the fall and, and before the, the city cleaned up the leaves and burnt them. You could burn leaves back then. And in front of my house, uh, we used to play hockey. And sometimes, you know, not a lot of cars back then, but it, the, the snow and the cars would pack it down and we could actually skate in front. And then the little intersections between the two roads, we'd play baseball during the during the summertime so it was a lot of activity on our streets with my my friends uh, those are really the memories um i had I remember getting my first goalie pads i just that was the the, the world could have ended for me back then and uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun and, and i also remember you know that when you called on your friends you yelled their name out right you know you, you, you didn't <laughs> ring the doorbell you didn't knock you just said Claude or Jimmy and and people would come they would come to the door and, and as a as a parent my children would ring doorbells and I'd say well you don't do that and then of course I don't know whether it was a Windsor thing or a 1950s thing but that's what we did yeah even just the thing of going to the park and seeing who was there and playing with them as opposed to prearranging things is that's such a such a bygone uh, kind of format. So, well, even getting permission to go, I mean, is something yeah. that we don't do that. We, we don't do that now. You don't strike off on your own, but my gosh, you just get lost and come back uh, uh, at a certain time and nothing was ever said. Yeah. Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? Well, uh, it was Gordy Howe. Um, I uh, remember him well and, and as a 10 year old, I remember sitting in front of the television and I had his picture. It was uh, one of these kind of um, beehive corn syrup pictures that you, you sent away for and you got it. No, no, no hockey cards back then. And, and I would, we had, we were running the fortune few that had television and, and I would watch him on uh, and hold the card up and games back then always started in the second period you know, it wasn't broadcast in the first period. You always hope for a power failure or a fight because then you got a little bit of the first period and then in the second, third period. So it was Al Kaline, uh, who was a right, a right uh, fielder for the Detroit Tigers, was also my hero. But, but it was really a Gordie Howe, Mr. Hockey, that, uh, that uh, was, was my, uh, my hero. Yeah, what a time. I mean, you're, you're in that Windsor, Detroit kind of bubble. Yes. Uh, what a great sports uh, community that was in that time, especially. Um, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Oh, no question, Mark. I mean, this is a hands down easy. I was going to be a teacher from grade four until my a month before I graduated from four years of university. I was going to be a teacher and uh, no question about it. I wanted to. I loved um imparting anything I knew to to others um I remember in summer summer I would we would play school I have desks brought out in our driveway and a blackboard and and uh I just round up anybody who who would be available and and try to teach them something and so so I knew that I wanted to be a teacher I, it was I always liked my teachers and uh I were fond of them and and um, and I wanted to to emulate them and we'll talk about how you veered from that path a little bit later. Um, what would you say is your life story in six words? Ooh, um, 
for a guy who's not very brief, I mean, this is tough for me. I think um, to sum up my career life, I'd say came for a year and stayed for a half century. I think that really sums it up. I, I began to work uh, for the government. I didn't really want to go there and work. I didn't want the job, um, but I said, well, I'll try it a year. And um, the trick was to, uh, I mean, the thrill was to come to Toronto actually. And, uh, and then I said, well, I'll go, I'll go and teach. Uh, and, uh, and my gosh, uh, I've, this year, I'll begin my 54th year as a wow. government employee. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> For what do you feel most grateful? Well, I think no question, my wife, Darlene. Um, no, one, no one is more special and precious to me. Uh, I think to love and be loved is, is something that is, is one could never hope for anything more than that. We met it in geology lab at university and we've been married for, for 53 years. Oh, that's wonderful. What has been the best year of your life so far? Oh, and why? gee. You know, Mark, it, that's a tough one. I mean, I think I can tell you the best week. Okay, was, sure. <laughs> the, first, the first week of December 2001, on the Saturday, our youngest daughter got married. On the Sunday, my first grandchild had his first uh, birthday. And then Monday, my wife and I flew to Ottawa and I received the Order of Canada. I think that was packed into that long weekend. There was a lot of, of memories and, and thrills and, and firsts. That's beautiful and a well-deserved Order of Canada. Um, what, what's been the toughest year of your life so far and why? Well, I, I think this year has been, I think it's for everybody, it's been just so unprecedented. Um, and, and yes, me, but, but for others, even more so. I, I just think about the people who have got young families, have to stay at home and struggle with so many issues. Um, for my grandson, who's just, uh, finished his third year university, had to spend it at home this year. For our granddaughter, who, you know, had her eyes set on, heart set on, graduating and uh, prom in her last year of high school, that's been taken from her. And, and um, for me, I mean, I, I've uh, learned how to work from home and, and still do it for my wife. It's been touched this, this house arrest has been just too long and, and, and difficult. And, and for somebody my age, I think for a young person, it's like a hiccup for a person my age. I mean, it's, it's lost time. I mean, you just may not be able to, to do next year what you could have done two years ago. Yeah, that's a great point. I've thought about this pandemic very much in the context of, of people who are younger and how they're missing things. You know, you only get to be in grade five once and you only get to be, you know, in your first year of university once. Um, and, and that, you know, or you, or you only get to be, you know, second year Adam in hockey once, uh, you know, and th those moments are taken away from kids. Yeah. And then I think of people in my mom's generation who, you know, they're, they're more conscious of how finite their, their opportunities are for traveling and for seeing people. And, and, you know, that this, this time period has robbed them of many of those moments. I know for us, my wife and I, we love to travel and that's been denied for a year and a half. And, uh, and it's just, you just wonder if uh, when everything opens up again, whether, you know, you'll, you'll have the energy or the health to, to be able to do that. So that's uh that's really uh, yeah. uh, disappointing, for sure. What one person would you say has had the greatest impact on your life? Well, I think a person at my age probably has several people that have impacted my life. My mother, certainly, uh, as, a, as a youngster, I think she instilled in me hard work and, and, um, and, and fairness and all the qualities. Uh, um, and I guess my disappointment is I never really knew that till after her passing as, as much as I, as I do now. Um, at work, I think my, uh, there was a fellow who was Mr. Climatology for Canada, Morley Thomas, who lived to 100 years old. I mean, for a climatologist to, to cover a century is, is quite, we think in centuries, we work in centuries, and, and to live it was, uh, but he, he was really good to me. He, he was several levels above me. He gave me opportunities. I tried not to disappoint him. I think what the one lesson he taught me, the, the, the attribute is not writing. I mean, I've, I, I sometimes struggle with writing, but he taught me how to edit. And, and I always think that editing is, I say to my children, I said, 
get all your thoughts down. But it's it's when you edit is is really when you can turn something into uh, into a real manuscript. So I love to edit, Mark. I will sit in my easy chair. I don't edit on the computer. It's uh, it's double space pages with an HB pencil, and I'll sit there with a coffee and a classical music, and I'll just uh, I just lose myself in my words and trying to reorganize, and then be pleased at the end, and then enter the computer and print it out again and start the process over again. Wow. What is the most important lesson that you've learned that you would share with other people? Well, I think it's always hard work and, and, and focus and, and even rehearse. I think I waste a lot of time just rehearsing things that I do in order that I can cover all, all bases. I think passion. I, I really believe that um, what I've learned is to be passionate and not in a false way, but in a real way. Um, you know, I, I think I am a passionate person when it comes to what I do and, and even how well I do it sometimes is based on, on that, uh, that passion. And, and I know that when I sometimes do a, I'll do a radio interview and I know it's a little different when you're just chatting with somebody, but when you're beginning to talk about weather, in my case, I know when, when radio people phone me and they'll say, well, can we do a, a voice check? And I'll say, okay. And they'll say, what did you have for breakfast? And then you, you say something and then, then the interview starts often with somebody else. And as soon as the weather is mentioned, my gosh, my adrenaline rush. And it's, I'm sure the board is all hot then at that time. And yeah. uh, they think, oh my gosh, tune it down. I, I remember once though, uh, uh, the passion God uh, you know, presented a problem for me. I, I was doing this, this little film, film vignettes for uh, TVO. And it was for uh, children who were preschool. Mark, can you imagine the challenge trying to talk about weather to kids who are three and four and maybe five years old? I mean, it was it was really tough. And so I did about three or four vignettes with them. But the first one, they came to Environment Canada's building. And they wanted me to be the scientist. And it was, I think the first one was to talk about colors of the rainbow. And, um, and I remember um, setting up in a lab with a white coat on and and, uh, and the two stars of this program were, uh, were uh, Howie and uh, Boo Boo, and they were puppets. And Howie would speak, but Boo Boo would just grunt. And um, so we, we started in, it was about a six minute thing, and they would break every 30 seconds and go over the script and look at it and position and everything. So it was really a long drawn out thing. And so after the first two, um, first episode, I said to the producer or the director, I said, do you want to be to be animated? And he said, oh my gosh, yes, be animated. We, we can't get scientists who are, who are animated, you see. So, you know, be as, be as friendly and open and excited as possible. And so I did that. And so then after about two segments, he came to me, David, could you come over here? He said, could you tone it down a bit? You're upstaging the puppets. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, all right, yeah. I will do what I'm told. But hey, that, that, was, uh, that, that was sometimes being too passionate. But hey, that is sort of a, a lesson I learned. Uh, and I like yeah, to impart to I love that lesson. And, and you know, I, and I think going back to w when people ask me, you know, my favorite guests, and I always think of you, it's because you have this passion for what you're talking about and you love it so much. And I always say, you know, in, in radio, where I've spent a lot of my career, um, I'd rather have a great guest talking about, um, you know, an unimportant topic than a mediocre guest talking about a really important topic, because uh -huh. it's ultimately in radio, all there is, is that person's voice. And, yes. and, and when you're talking about the weather, your passion is so evident, you know, so that's wow. what makes you a great guest. Um, what would you say people would be most surprised to learn about you? Well, Mark, here's a guy that gives 50 talks a year public talks to Rotary and Probus to Congresses and scientific groups. I do probably 500 to 600 interviews a year on all platforms. Um, and maybe not as many in the last year because of, of the pandemic, but, but certainly up there. I mean, this morning I had two interviews before I, I began to chat with, uh, with you. But people would be surprised that I'm a very shy guy. I, I'm painfully shy. I mean, Mark, it's not just strangers. It's sometimes with friends and colleagues and family. I mean, I, you know, one of the moments, I love getting together with 
our two children and at Christmas and there were parties and talking and everybody's talking and laughing and reliving moments of, the, of that year or the past. And, and there I am with smiles on my face and enjoying it, but not saying a word. I, I just am a real introverted kind of person. And I, I, people think, oh, gosh, he's got 33,000 weather stories. He'd be a great guy to invite to your wine and cheese party. No, I'm a, I really wouldn't be, you say. And so I, I, that, that, that's something that I, I've dealt with my whole life. And, uh, and I've tried to overcome it with certain things, but it is something that I'm clearly aware of. How have you overcome it? What have you done to overcome your shyness? Well, um, I think one of the things that I've, um, I've done is I, first of all, I think I, I rehearse. As I said, mentioned to you earlier, I sometimes um, waste a lot of time overworking on something. I'll do something and then I'll go over it and edit it and this type of thing. So I, I'm shy even in a, in a written kind of way. But in a, in a verbal way, I when I go to give a talk somewhere, I might come out. I purposely go early. I sit in my car and I and I, I read it over. I go over it. And I practice. I mean, it's it's I, I just uh, as if I was speaking to the audience right there in my car. I mean, people look at me as if I'm strange, but but it's something I, I try to find a, a private spot and 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 do it. Um, and then you know, as a as a youngster, as a as a last year of high school, and university um, and as a young parent, I did some little theater and people would say, you went on stage? And I said, yes. And, and I found that people who are in theater are either really introverted or really extroverted. And, and you know, as maybe a character, um, I was the, uh, the lawyer in the Kane Mutiny Court Martial in grade 13. And I, I did a mad tango scene at university and having an argument with uh, either my wife or, uh, or my mistress in a play. And, uh, or um, in a young parent, uh, I was the drowned sailor, not only alive and well, sir, but I'm the drowned man, sir. And so I felt that maybe I felt that I wasn't David Phillips, but I was that character. And so therefore it helped me to maybe express myself and, 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 and then being in a, a passion of weather. Um, I, I've studied it for, for a half century or more. I'm comfortable with it. And so I feel confident in it. And so therefore I'm able to, I think, overcome my fears or my, my reluctance or my, my shyness from, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. But ask me anything else on a different topic and you'd find somebody who's pretty, pretty, closed mouth about it. What's the scariest thing you've ever done? Well, let me see. I've, I've done those compulsory kind of thrill rides at, at Wonderland or in Disney World. <laughs> and I've, hey, I've white knuckled it in, in lake effect snowstorms for sure. Uh, um, but I, I really can't think of any that have been um, a moment where I've really just been, you know, brought to my knees because of being scared. If you were giving a commencement address to a group of students today, what would be your message? Well, I, I think it'd be two things. One, it'd be an environmental message and then maybe a life message. And I think from um, environmental, I would look out to that group and see them all in their Sunday vest and their parents, proud parents. And I'd say, well, you know, you're an elite and privileged uh, kind of group and you have a responsibility, I think, to promote environmental awareness and act activeness as a way of life. And, and as a way of life, I mean, you to play and, and to work and to live in a sustainable kind of way. And, and I think not just to do it, do it automatically. I think it's like, it, I, I would love it to be where the environment is in sustainable practices were done just as you would fasten a seatbelt or, or, or look at your Twitter account. Uh, it would just become automatic, I think. And, that, and that's what I would say. I think from a, a life point of view, I would say that, um, you know, that, that line is always about have a dream and, and go for it. I mean, I couldn't top that. But again, it would be one of passion and enjoy what you do. It's, it's not about money or, or, or power or authority. I had none of that. Um, it's really about contentment and, and satisfaction and feeling good that you 
you did what you wanted to accomplish. And, and I would just say, you know, it's a matter, I know it's cliche-ish, but give it your best and believe in yourself and work hard, but, but also have fun. What's your boldest prediction for the future? Well, I mean, it's, that's an easy question to ask of a weather guy. I mean, I, I probably have always got a, a forecast in my, my hip pocket. And lately, it's always been about, are you go- when are you going to retire? Not what the summer's going to be. And <laughs> I don't know the, the answer to either of those. But I, I think you ask for boldness. I mean, I, I, I think it, for me, it's, I am confident that we will solve the, the climate crisis. I mean, I, I really, really do feel that. I, I think it's, it's real, um, it's serious, it's, it's not just a fake news or a fantasy. I mean, it is uh, clearly something that is a, is a threat and we're not having to wait for it, it's, it's happening now. And, uh, and, and so I think the science, I believe, is solid and strong, Mark. I, I think the, the trends are, 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 are known. Um, and it's, there's a lot of uncertainty. There always is, but just because we don't know everything about it doesn't mean we, we should ignore what we do know about it. And I think we, we know what the problem is. We know what the solution is. We have the engineering science and, and technological skills to solve it. And what just is, is missing is the political and public will. And I think what's going to drive us there is nature itself. I think um, we just haven't seen anything yet. And I think the extremes of of weather have been the last thing to come. The warming has been there, the variability has been there, but it's really the arrival of extremes of weather, not like our grandparents had to deal with, I think will drive us to uh, recognition that this is happening and that we need to do something about it. And and I feel confident, especially when I see the youth and the and the spirit that they have and the and, and the want to do it. Um, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future, something I won't experience, but it's something that I think my, my grandchildren and their children will experience. Is there a book that's had a big impact on you? Is there one book that you're most likely to recommend to other people? Well, Mark, you know, I don't recommend books or movies or restaurants. Um, I, um, gosh, I, I like getting recommendations. I just, I feel sort of, Again, maybe it's that shyness about giving mm. people a suggestion from, 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 from my experiences. I, I had just finished for the second time uh, a book on the beginnings of Canadian meteorology because our service, the Meteorological Service of Canada, is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. And wow. so I'm doing a lot of uh, research and, and writings on that. And so I, I reread that uh, book. And, and I do have a recommendation by a, a deputy minister of the environment that I heard was um, the man who ran Washington, the life and times of James Baker III. And so I've, I've got that, and that'll be my next read, but hey, I haven't started yet. Okay. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Thank you for answering those questions, David. In okay. just a moment, we're going to continue digging deep with David Phillips. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. 
Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. David, you spoke about passion earlier, and it's interesting to hear you talk about your passion for the weather. And I recently heard a podcast interview with Angela Duckworth, who is a, a university professor and author who wrote a book about grit. And she talks about the difference between following your passion, which is what people often say you should do, and developing a passion. And I think you're actually an example of somebody who developed a passion because you didn't set out to be in the weather business, right? That, that You mentioned earlier, you were going to be a teacher. So how did it end up that you spent more than 50 years with Environment Canada if your plan was to be a teacher? Well, Mark, it's really, it's interesting. I mean, I would like to tell you, I was four years old. I had weather instruments in my backyard and I was subscribed to WeatherWise magazine, and that would all be a lie. I mean, Windsor is the thunderstorm capital of Canada. It is the tornado uh, beginning of Tornado Alley that stretches from Windsor up to Lake Simcoe. Um, and I remember asking my mother, I mean, um, she held me as a youngster, uh, as a one-year-old, to see a tornado come right across our front our front area. I mean, it was a, a, one of the deadliest tornadoes in Canadian history, it killed 16 people. And I said to her, why didn't we go to the basement? She said, well, we didn't have a basement uh, at that time. But so people didn't even know the safety rules. And so I, I went into uh, to geography at, at university. I studied some weather, had a teacher, a professor who was, who was a climatologist. And, and actually I was really, I went to Environment Canada or Department of Transport Meteorological Branch back then. Uh, only really to please her, I think, because I wanted to do this uh, teaching. And, um, and so I, um, I but, but then what I found in my early career, it was all about scientific writings and going to scientific conferences. And I enjoyed that. I was doing research on the Great Lakes. And, um, but what I found, Mark, was that when I would always give my, begin my talk with a story, a weather story, and just to kind of set it up. And people often would ask about the story. And so I discovered this passion that Canadians have for the weather, this obsession that we have, that we talk about it more than any other subject. I mean, we're known as the weather people in the world. And so then I began to kind of uh, turn that kind of hobby of getting stories and history and turning it into something that I could share with Canadians. And, and it's that, that sort of teaching aspect. My, I, I, I still was a teacher. My classroom was Canada, and I had 40 million students, you say. And so I would teach uh, about the weather, and I found that there was this fascination with it. 
And, and it also, it was, you know, if people thought that weather was science, they'd feel intimidated, but it's for them, it's lifestyle. You see, it's, it's how you'd begin your everyday learning about what the weather is, you see. And 93% of Canadians, my gosh, begin the day. We're not united on anything other than our need to know the weather. And the fact that we get a forecast, 93% of Canadians, and, and then plan your, your particular day. The other thing is that we've got a lot of weather in this country. It's not like Malta or Cyprus or Honolulu or tomorrow's like yesterday. I mean, it changes yeah. on a dime. And, and I think that, so, so really it's the subject is interesting to Canadians. I felt that I could fill a void by explaining uh, the weather to, and, and I've always felt that entertaining is first and education becomes second. I always feel that you have to entertain the audience and then they're going to, it's almost like the snake oil salesman. You kind of soften them up before you sell them the bill of goods. And with that song and dance, well, my song and dance is weather trivia, weather stories. And then when they're ready, then I give them a hard message and, and maybe they, 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 they learn from, from that. So, so really it just is something you're right, Mark. I didn't begin to do this. I just fell into it and, and it's a comfort level uh, for me. And, uh, and there were moments where we were important. We might talk about that later, about where these sort of, when that became very clear to me uh, that I could fill a void there and, and yeah. take that path or direction. Yeah, l- let's talk about that in a moment. But I, I love the point you just made about entertaining people first and educating them second, because I think that's the job of any storyteller or any, you know, and and I was going to ask you about how you learned your communication skills and how you learned to become a storyteller, because that's, that's effectively what you are. You're, you're sharing important information, but you're wrapping it in a narrative. And I think that is a lesson for anyone who wants to impart information to others to make that information memorable and sticky to make it useful to people. So tell me more about that. Yeah, and I, you're right. I, I often say I'm more of a storyteller than a, than a research scientist. I mean, I haven't written a, a scientific article in maybe a, a decade or two, but I've written books and magazine articles and calendars and, and more popularizing it. And, and, you know, it's tougher a writing. I mean, it's a different kind of writing than scientific writing, but um, it, it is, it's almost like it's telling a story to your, your neighbor or to your child and and uh, explaining to them what you what you do. And it was just this passion that I had for getting stories and history. I began as a history buff and then moved into geography. And so history has always been something that has um, uh, fascinated me. And it's, it's about story, uh, story, uh, storytelling. And, um, and I have 33,000 weather stories in my collection. And I've, I've learned too that, you know, when you're in um, many berries, Alberta or or Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, you don't tell Toronto weather stories. You tell about their own misery and hardship and, and misfortune. People want to know how they've dealt with uh, these. And, and really, even the story of Canada is how we've overcome um, distances and, 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 and weather extremes. And, uh, and it is really our, our story. And so, so therefore, I find it's a natural for me to, uh, uh, to, to tell stories. And the other thing I do is to is to make it the stories, but also trivia. You know, I'm, I'm a kind of a trivia guy, you know, I, I, again, it's this entertainment, you know, that did you know, for example, that the average sneeze is the same force as the category two hurricane, or that men are hit four times more often by lightning than women, you say. And so often I will begin a, a talk with a few little nuggets of gee, wow, whiz, and then it leaves them kind of you know, leaves them laughing maybe and wanting more, like you say. And so then it's it's sort of a technique that I use to to as again soften them up and get the serious message and and um, and then when they ask me questions, it's often about the trivia that I talk about. So, yeah. but people people enjoy they want to be entertained. They don't want to be lectured or preached to. And and my subject of climate change, boy, you can really preach at people, but. Hey, you want them to, uh, you don't want to scare them too much and you want them to, to uh, learn something from it. So I think storytelling, trivia uh, um, exchange uh, is, uh, is something that, that works. It's worked for me. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned you've done, uh, you know, you do typically five or 600 media interviews a year. Do you remember mm-hmm. the first one? Do you remember some of your early experiences with that? Well, I do. It was back in the 1970s, and that was a decade when we were going through 
the ice age cometh, uh, the nuclear winter. It was one of the coldest and snowiest decades in, uh, in, in across Canada in, in, in the 20th uh, century. Um, and I remember global television came and wanted to do an interview on whether we should look to the north to see if that ice front has moved a little closer. And my boss has said, well, you, you know, you do the interview. And, and I said, oh, I didn't want to do it and, and that. And, um, and, and, but I, I said, okay. And they do a, a pre-interview first. They, on the Friday, they, they called me and they talked about, well, this is what, what would your answer to this question be? And, and this type of thing. And um, not the person who's going to interview me. It was just the, the, the producer or the writer. And then when Monday came around, it warmed up on the weekend and the interview was canceled. So I was greatly relieved that, that then I thought, well, they don't know the difference between climate and weather, but hey, that's all right. I didn't really want to, to do it. But I do remember the first occasion that I, I had a, a serious on-air interview and how nervous I was. And, and uh, if, if you want me, I could tell you that story. because. Sure. Oh, so, well, Mark, it was, I was doing, I was, first of all, I was doing something for Treasury Board called the Severity Index for Canada. And this was like a, an isolation post allowance. They would pay government employees via dug ditches in Sarnia or Fort McMurray. You'd be paid more in Fort McMurray because you had a hostile environment to have to deal with compared to Sarnia. Oh. So if you lived in an isolated location, you got a little bit more remuneration. So it's like, so current, it's like a danger pay based on the climate. Exactly, yeah. right, exactly. And this is called a isolation post allowance. And so for, and the, the one that was used for many, many years, it, it sort of had where Ottawa was more of a hardship post than Whitehorse. So it left a lot to be desired as to the, 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 the basis for this. And so I looked at it, it had four different factors. So I thought, well, I'm going to do a better job here. I looked at it year round. Um, I looked at 17, 18 different negative factors, you know, like freezing rain, fog, strong winds, uh, uh, humidity. So all of the negative aspects. And I compared to 180 locations in Canada, I came up with this, what I call this climate severity index for Canadians. And it didn't, it didn't, I knew it was on the target. It was very subjective. And I talked to many of my colleagues who had visited many parts of Canada to ask them what were the negative aspects of working in the high Arctic or uh, on the coasts or, or what have you. So I gave it to, to Treasury Board and they looked at it and then shelved it. And then Margaret Monroe of Southern News got it and interviewed me and just on the uh, just on a telephone. And then she wrote an article on it and it became, it was the perfect article. Um, it was in August, dead news time. It was about our weather, which is our passion or obsession for Canadians. And it pitted one city against the other, Edmonton against Calgary and Regina against Saskatoon and Toronto against the rest of Canada. And, and it received front page headlines, not the headline, but the headline, the banner above it. And people were, people weighed in on it. Jack Webster right. out and he, he uh, said some nasty things about it because, and I, all I said was, who had the, the severest weather in Canada? Not the worst or the best. I mean, they translated it into that. And John Crosby even said some, some nasty, almost libelous things about me. And so then the media called. And I had to go on cross-country checkup in Canada AM. Never had done an interview before. And I went on those programs. My, my knees were shaking. I had to put my hands on my knees on Canada AM so that they wouldn't be so obvious. And, and I did it, I answered the questions and, and, and then my boss said, yeah, you did all right, you know, you got some words out and that was good. And, and what I found is I kind of enjoyed it. It was almost like I was out of character. I wasn't David Phillips. I was this, this, this other person. It was like I was acting and I was teaching. I mean, two, two things that I most loved, you see. And, um, and, and so I, I then, um, I got kind of, I felt there was a, I was still nervous doing it. I was still tense. It would just, it would exhaust me to get an interview, a six minute interview. And I'd be just, just incredibly exhausted at the end. But there was a kind of a cute follow-up to with, uh, with John Crosby. I, I've got to share this, one of my favorite stories. And, 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 for, and for people uh, who don't remember, John Crosby was a cabinet minister, a Newfoundland and Labrador politician, big figure, great character, yes. a larger than life figure. Yeah. 
very much so. And he, I think he was fighting an election at the time. So he came out and said some very nasty things about me and said, but then he said, um, well, okay, maybe in Newfoundland, we could appreciate a fine day more than the rest of Canada. Because Mark, what the index had said was that Newfoundland, St. John's Newfoundland in terms of Southern Canada had the most severe weather. I mean, most fog, freezing rain, snow and, and wind than any other major city in Canada. And so it was clearly the more points you had in this index, the, the more severe you were. And so then about three or four years later, so when he said that comment, I thought, well, maybe he does understand the, the index if he feels that they can appreciate a fine day more than the rest of Canada. So about four years later, I went to Newfoundland for the first time. And I was interviewed on a program, Shirley Newhook, who sadly passed away very recently. And she was everything in Newfoundland. You were on her program, you had really reached the big time. And so she said to me, the very first question on air, um, have you ever been to Newfoundland before? I said, no, this is my first time. She said, well, last week, Maureen McTeer, Joe Clark's wife, came to uh, Newfoundland and it was her first visit. And Jane Crosby said to Maureen, come prepared because we have the worst weather in Canada. And I thought, Mark, my gosh, if I hadn't reached John Crosby, at least I got to his wife. <laughs> Good for you. And but there I mean, there is an example. And obviously you're you're everything that's happened since then has proven it. But that was kind of your first wide scale exposure to how much people cared about the weather, how much it meant to them, how you just have to say something about the weather and you will touch off a debate. Right. It's like it's it, it, the equivalent of hockey in this country. It is. And, and they defend it. I mean, people yeah. will defend the weather in their particular location and and will throw stones at at other people's um, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, weather. You know, it's just something about and, you know, we don't all live in Victoria. We don't all retire in Victoria. I mean, um, we we love where we are and it's often the culture, it's family, it's other things. I mean, we can talk about the weather like no other business, but it uh, and there's every moment has has its good good times. I remember once other time I was in Newfoundland and I was it was a forecast. This was back when you had to fly out a Saturday to save money on your flight. And it was a talk I was giving on the Monday. And so I went for a walk on the on the Sunday and um and and and, and people I would meet people on the on the on the walk and um and it was a beautiful day. The forecast was to be lousy. It turned out to be sunny blue skies. And uh, and people said I thought people would say, well, isn't it a nice day? But no, in Newfoundland, they say, isn't it good to be alive? And so it's almost the extreme of a fine day for the rest of Canada. So right. we, we are passionate about our weather for sure. Yeah. So something I wanted to bring up, which people may not realize is, as you've mentioned, uh, you've, you've collected all these stories, you've written books, you've given talks across the country, uh, you've produced this weather calendar every year, which people love. It's one of the the best selling calendars in Canada, if not the best some years. Um, and you've never actually made any money off that, right? The, <laughs> the money all goes to the government because you're doing this within your job, right? Well, that's right. And and I that doesn't bother me. I mean, my gosh, I uh, I could have money does never uh, motivates me. Um, um, I'm paid well for what I do. And it's a love of what I do. So I feel as if my gosh, I'd probably do it for nothing if the government knew about that. And, but, but really the calendars, they've made millions of dollars. It was, you're right. It was the most popular calendar sold in Canada, even outsell the playboy calendar, which shows you what our priorities are. At this <laughs> but um, it, it, uh, and it was, uh, and, and I would have a, a travel every year to promote it. Um, uh, travel from one coast to the other. And you know, Mark, it didn't bother me if they never, if I went into a radio studio, I had to go fly into Regina. I had seven or eight interviews that day. Um, and it would be a focus would of course be the calendar, but sometimes they wouldn't even ask me about the calendar. They'd say, well, what about the summer ahead or what's the, 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 the agricultural season going to be like? And it didn't bother me. I mean, hey, I wasn't there because no, I didn't make a dollar off of it, but I, if it was the tagline to leave and say, well, he's the author of the weather trivia calendar, or here's a quiz question, give one away, then hey, I went for it. But it was hard work because what Mark I found was that I had to bone up on every city I went to. I had to perish all the weather stories from the, and, and just 
focus on stories from if you were in Regina one day, then you always just talked about Regina stories. If you flew to Calgary, then you had to forget Regina and talk. It's not like an author writing a book. I mean, there was preparation right. at night on the plane and, and everywhere, and it was grueling, but hey, it was a labor of love. And, um, and, uh, and, and you're right. I, 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 and, but there was no risk. I wasn't as if I was investing my money in this. If it didn't go over well, well, hey, it, it still was a, was a calendar. And, um, and so it provided a ticket for me into the broadcast studio. And I could talk about climate change or the coming summer or winter or season. So I always felt it was a way in to, to express and, and share my information and, and data with, uh, with Canadians. Is it true that you also uh, created an invention of, of some kind? Is there, is there a story around <laughs> your one invention? <laughs> well, there is. There is. Gosh, I, I, I do. It, it's what I call seat belts for toilets. And you know, Mark, seat belts for toilets. A, okay, seat belts for toilets. It's it's not gone anywhere. I haven't. I'm not an entrepreneur, but it's an idea that I had, and and it came from a, a fellow in um, in Oklahoma, a friend, a meteorologist who did a lot of work for insurance companies, and he said to me, David, you know, the last thing to go in a tornado is the is is the toilet. I mean, it's anchored down there, and you often see roofs are gone and walls have collapsed, but hey, there's still the tornado there, or still the, the toilet. And so I said, well, okay, um, that would be a good idea, seat belts for toilets. You see that twister coming down and you, you'd strap yourself in, you say. So I was then, I was giving a talk in Ottawa at the Nepean Theater for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And, um, and I was in the green room and I was preparing, thinking about what I was gonna say and, and talk about, and, and there was this knock on the door. And so it was the CTV uh, crew were there, a cameraman, a, a sound man, a, a, the, the journalist and, and a student, I think. And they wanted to talk to me before the interview, before the uh, speech. And I said, well, OK. So they came in and I said, what are you going to talk about? I said, well, I'm going to talk about our, our obsession with weather as Canadians and inventions that we form, the you know, snowblower, the snowplow, the snow shovel and the frozen fish and all these kinds of things that, um, and then I said, I'm also gonna share a new, uh, I've got seat belts for toilets. And I was only trying to kid them, tease them a little bit. And they said, oh, so I said, yeah. And I gave them the story. And then they went into the, in the green room, the toilet and they had me flush it and it went the water going down and that. And then at that night, I'd forgotten about it. And at night that aired on the, in Ottawa, it aired the next morning and it aired at noon, nonstop. <laughs> and everywhere I would walk in Ottawa, people say, hey, we saw that seat belts for toilets. I thought, oh my gosh, Mark, my career's <laughs> come to an end. It's, it's toilet humor. They're gonna say cease and desist. No more are you gonna do interviews. So I went to, it was at the, one of the Canadian Museum for Nature, I think. And there was a, I was giving a talk on climate change and they brought in a student group from high school, two high schools in the Ottawa area. And so I did it. We did a question and answer. And I was walking out. A young person came up to me, a boy, and said, hey, I saw that seat belts for toilets. He said, you know what? I didn't realize that a safe place to be in a tornado is in a bathroom. We don't have a basement. So now I know that maybe it's the, it's the bathroom I should go to. Well, I almost hugged him because I felt as if I was able to save myself and saying, well, you know, I was imparting that you know, weather safety. And, and so anyways, that, that was the, that was the, the seat belts for toilets. All right. Well, there is a good tip in there. Grab onto the yes. toilet. If, uh, <laughs> if there's a tornado coming for your home and you can't right. get to the basement. Yeah. Um, you must David, uh, everywhere you go. And I know under, under normal circumstances, you'd be out in the community more. And I think you used to, uh, before the, the pandemic, uh, you used to take the train into Toronto every day from your home, right? Yes. You right. must yes. have people coming up to you all the time wanting to talk about the weather. Is that the case? It is. I mean, it is often, I mean, people, I think Canadians are very polite. They, they kind of leave you alone, but, uh, but often in airports or in, in uh, go train or in settings, um, I, um, uh, people will, will often come up and, and share a story. And again, it's one of these shy kind of moments, you know, I, I never know what to say, like, I know ever how to get out of the situation. 
And in grocery stores, I'll be shopping and somebody will say, hey, you're the weather guy. Like, you know, uh, um, and, and so they might make a joke of it or I try to say something about the weather and then move on. And then you see them again in the next aisle. And it's just, oh, my gosh, it's just an uncomfortable uh, situation uh, for, for me. Uh, I, I, um, it, is, um, it is something that I, I, I don't relish, but I understand it. What are you've you've talked about your collection of thirty three thousand weather stories and how you've you've accumulated this over time and I'm I'm fascinated by how you did that and 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 how you gather those stories but uh, do you have favorites among those stories? Yeah, I, I I do. I mean, I guess the uh, the day that Niagara Falls ran dry was a was a story that I uncovered through diaries and history books. Uh, and um, uh, my gosh, I even had a book, a best-selling book uh, uh, that captured that particular story in it. Um, I, I think uh, uh, Strange Things Falling from the Sky, like 1921 in Calgary, uh, a fish fell from the sky, um, um, or, or sorry, frogs fell from the sky into, uh, and probably picked up by a water spout, some kind of uh, a wind event. Uh, from a, uh, a, a wetlands and brought them into the city and, and much to the light of the, of the local cats, uh, uh, they were, uh, <laughs> they loved it. Uh, I guess the one with, the one that's kind of interesting too, is that some of your listeners might remember the, uh, the walk in the blizzard with uh, Pierre Trudeau. And so right. I have a kind of a, a Pierre Trudeau story. And, and okay. here it so is. Th I'm this is uh, February 29th, 1984, when, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the father of the current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, went for a walk in Ottawa um, and decided that he would step down as as Prime Minister. And it became known as the walk in the snow. Right. And and it, it's become actually a bit of an expression. You know, he went for a walk, like applying to many other people, like he went for his walk in the snow to make the big decision. Right. Yes, exactly. One of these epiphany kind of moments that, you know, it just um, and so so here I have I began my career, you know, a year before Pierre Trudeau became prime minister. And I'm I'm here when his son is the prime minister at the yeah. end of my, my career. That's a, a long, long period. But anyways, I was preparing my weather trivia calendar and I I remembered the story that walk in the snow, the walk in the blizzard, whatever. And you're right. It's become part of our lexicon. And so I thought, well, I put that story in my calendar. And, um, and so I looked it up, the first indications of it, it was a weekend storm. And I looked up and there was like six centimeters of snow that fell in, in, uh, in Ottawa. I thought, well, Ottawa is the snowiest national capital in the world. I mean, if you lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, you might retire, but, but hardly Ottawa. And so I thought, well, um, I wrote to Mr. Trudeau and he had retired by then. And, um, and he wrote back very promptly. I was surprised by that. And a very nice letter. And he explained to me it was the Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. He came home, put his boys to bed. He went for this long, long walk over several hours, came back, had a sauna, and then made a decision to get out of Canadian politics. And, but it was the way he said it to me that I thought was sort of kind of so typical Trudeau. He said, after explaining to me it was the Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, he said, um, I hope the above set your mind at rest. In other words, Phillips, get a life. Why would you worry <laughs> about something like that? And then in the next sentence, Mark, he says, I appreciate you being so thorough. So there was you tore you down and built you up in the same paragraph. But hey, it was a moment that I could confirm for history when that walk was. And there was, Mark, there were 36 centimeters of snow fell in that snowstorm for even for Ottawa. That's one of the snowiest moments in history. Wow. And an important moment in political history yes. as well. So you've mentioned a couple of times, David, just how long a career you've had. Um, you could have retired many years ago, I think. Right. Is that yes. not the case it with a, with a full government pension? Uh, Absolutely. 19 years ago, I could have you know, retired on full government pension. And then um, stayed at home. Um, and uh, but I, oh, I why not? What what's kept you? You know what's kept you going? And and uh, what what's made you decide every year not to do that? Well, I mean, I, I I think that it's my wife has been very kind. I mean, she's always if she wanted me to to retire, I would have. 
She knows how much I enjoy it, uh, uh, labor of love for me, but, uh, and so she encourages and supports me. That's very, very important. I've had my, my health, which is, is, is uh, also a factor. I've had uh, bosses who want me to do, uh, to carry on. I mean, they, if, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I think that's important. I mean, I've been very supportive of people who, and, but then also I have people who are receptive. They want to hear about the message, the story and, and, and climate. I mean, Mark, when I became a climatologist, nobody could spell the word. And now I get kids and parents who write to me and say, well, how can we become a, how can my son or daughter become a climatologist and what does it take in that? And so that, that makes me feel good that, um, that what you've chosen in your career uh, has become the most important environmental issue that humankind has ever faced and that people want to pursue that kind of um, a career. And so that's, it's just something I've got the energy and the passion. Maybe if I had other, other, other interests. I, I'm not I'm a one trick pony, you know, I don't really have other hobbies than that. Uh, maybe I will when I retire, I don't know, but it's just, um, I get up at the same morning every day uh, before five o'clock. Um, I, 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 I work and, and enjoy it, but it's something I, I love to do. And, uh, and, and that's why I, um, I keep doing it. I, um, yeah, you love what you do and you, you keep doing it. So, um, how have you stayed healthy? How have you kept your energy? You know, like, tell me some of your, your practices. You, you mentioned you get up early every day. That's obviously a yeah. big part of it. Um, what, what else do you do to, to sustain your energy and, and be able to continue working? Well, I try to be happy and, and, and uh, that I think is uh, not stressful. Uh, avoid that kind of thing. Um, I, um, I, I think I, I eat well in the sense that I, I go for long walks. Uh, I live, we live in Barrie, Ontario, which is north of Toronto on Lake Simcoe. We have a beautiful view and a lot of, a lot of vistas and walking, uh, uh that I do. So, um, I, I, it's not anything particularly magical. It's just about, um, doing the right things from a health point of view as I try to, and, um, Maybe I have good genes. Uh, I don't know, but I, um, I, 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 I just, um, and I think it's also, you know, being active, being uh, pursuing something that you you like, and and it's juggling a lot of things, a lot of requests for me to do this or that, or, um, and um, and and I've always felt that I've always felt in my career, and and I feel sorry for some of my colleagues who, who I always feel that there has to be an end game in anything. And, and um, I always feel that has to end in some result. So when I'm usually assigned something, I usually ask questions about, well, what's going to come of this? Not, is this is not just a, way, a make work project, you say. Um, I want to see the, what the final result is going to be. I see so many of my colleagues who are, who are active and doing something that they're excited about. And then it just all of a sudden it ends. I mean, it's, they are onto something else. It's like an unfinished symphony there. And, and so I've always tried to make sure that that there is some end game, uh, an end result, to something. Whether it's going to be a publication or a, a talk or a, a situation, or maybe influencing policy or something like that, so that you're not wasting time when you when you're 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 working on it. I, I suspect there's something very present centered about you. Is that is that the case? Or you know, I I think of the. Um, you know, the expression that, that Annie Dillard uh, wrote one time, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. And I think there is sometimes, uh, you know, people sort of sacrifice day in and day out. Some people need to, of course, but some people kind of toil day in and day out because they have some long-term objective in mind, but you're just getting up every day and doing what you love. And so there's a, I mean, maybe that's part of the secret to happiness. Yeah, I, I think it is having something to do. Um, I always think you shouldn't work hard at working hard. Um, I, I think that uh, you shouldn't just make up things to do to keep yourself active. I mean, I, um, I, I generally feel that I, I can make a difference. I, um, there's that interest in people. And, you know, the thing is that often you think, well, gee, you know, you do so many under interviews. Doesn't it ever get boring for you? I mean, you're asked the same questions. 
I mean, there, there's this thing on CBC called syndication. You probably know about it, Mark. I mean, you're, you're interviewed once from Toronto and then it's offered right. 18 stations or 20 stations across the country. And it's not a taped. You do every one comes to you and asks the same question. Yeah, with a different um, host, right? So they, they basically sit you down in a studio. This is many people I know have been through this. They sit you down in a studio and every host uh, of a local show from across Canada on the CBC will interview you in sequence and they'll they'll all basically be given the same notes for the interview. So it's a little bit like you're a movie star being interviewed over and over again on a press junket about your film by a series of of Hollywood journalists and you're doing the same interview over and over again. Absolutely, Mark. I mean, you describe it so well. I mean, it is it is can be repetitive, but I have the same energy for the last interview as I had for the first one. I mean, it's something I, I work on. I want to do it. Now, it helps because what I try to do is localize it. So if they're calling you from Sydney, Nova Scotia or from uh, Prince Rupert, British Columbia, and you're right, they have the same questions, but you can often come up with information that is local to them that means something to to them you're not talking about something national something uh, something local so i work hard to provide that kind of local flavor to to what it is and the other thing too is that you know like i had an interview this morning about um what may was going to be like in saskatoon on, on, a, on a radio station and so what i sometimes do is i work to motivate me I will work at that little statistic that's an oddity. Like, well, you know, um, whenever I try to say, well, what's May going to be like? But I always set up what April was like. You know, what, what did you just come through? And, and so I said, well, you know, you had, for example, a record number of days where the temperature um, stayed below freezing at night. You know, it's kind of an exotic kind of record. But it's something that already sets the scene and it motivates me to work on it and get the. So sometimes, Mark, for a six minute interview, I might spend two and a half hours preparing for it. And much of it isn't even covered. But at least I feel as if I've got something. There's no dead news or dead air. I can I can come with it. And yeah, and after it, I'll look at it and say, oh, gee, why didn't I say that or this or that? But hey, that's all right. It's not it's not time uh, spent uselessly. So, David, as we wrap up, I, you're such a great storyteller, and I know you love all your weather stories. Um, I know that um, you once took a trip to the Arctic uh, and spoke to some school children there, and that that's, that's one of the, the experiences in your life and your career that stands out most for you. Did you want to share that story? <laughs> well, thank you, Mark, for asking me. That's one of my favorite stories. It was uh, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. They, they asked me to come north. Uh, to the Eastern Arctic and the Western Arctic and, and speak to um, uh, Inuit communities and, um, and to public audiences. And I spoke and, at night and, and, and even have to somebody to translate my talk into a Nuktitut and have a discussion with an elder on, on indigenous um, wisdom and, and uh, folklore. It was, it was just, for me, it was a great moment. Uh, and, uh, but then I went into schools I spoke to children or students in high school and, and elementary school. And, and Mark, there was such energy. I had spoken in the South, Southern schools and didn't find the energy there as much as I, I found in the, um, uh, in, the, in the North. I remember this one class of, of grade four um, and um, I was saying, now look, I'm going to tell you a weather story, but I want you to tell me weather stories. And they would tell me stories that would curl my hair. I mean, they'd shot a gun and this and, and the weather. And I thought, my gosh, I've never shot a gun before in my life. And, and this one little girl said to me, well, we went down south and we, um, we came outside and it was raining so hard, we couldn't see the other side of the street. And I said, oh, and I, that was south. And she said, yes. And I said, well, was that maybe in Disneyland and Disney World? And she said, no, it was a place called Guelph. <laughs> you know, I thought, okay. Guelph, Ontario, which is, yeah, Guelph, Ontario, still yes, well exactly. above the, the uh, 49th parallel. Yeah, true. And then the one other story I remember, it was another I brought instruments with me, like little, little experiments to show. And I had this one class of grade, grade threes, and they were 
sitting there just mesmerized by, and again, I was acting, I think, Mark, I was, I was sharing stories in this. And I said, okay, I'm going to create a cloud in a bottle. And um, so I got it all set up and uh, I had a bicycle pump and, and uh, it was building up and I wanted it to fail because I, I had one ingredient I wanted to ask. And I could just see them rising out of their seats and looking at me and, and then all of a sudden, no cloud. And they slumped down and almost I had betrayed them in a way. I said, oh, I forgot one other thing. You know, in the air, you have to have some impurities because this little water, this water that we can't see has to sit on something. Could be a little bit of salt. It could be a, a little microscopic uh, piece of dirt or what have you. So I got to put some dirt in that bottle. You see. So I said, I'm going to light this match. I'm going to throw it in there. The light, the match will go out. There'll be a little bit of cloud, a little bit of smoke, and then it'll disappear. And then it's dirty. And then I'll, I'll get the cloud. So they said, okay, okay. So I get to the point where I'm, I'm to do this. And I take the match and I strike it on this table, very, very smooth table. And I could hear this little guy in the front row, you know, uh, he was <laughs> like this and his veins were popping out of his forehead. And he said, Use your zipper. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh. I guess that's a way I could like that match. I mean, he had more street sense than I'll ever have, Mark. <laughs> I mean, and I did, and the cloud formed, and then and, and I was a hero to all those little kids. <laughs> that's wonderful. A uh, great little tip from a child <laughs> who's obviously <laughs> seen seen that that uh, that 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 in action in his family or something. Well, David, this has been such a pleasure. Uh, we've had so many great conversations over the years, uh, but I, I've never had the chance to spend this much time with you at once. So yeah. I'm very grateful for that. Again, I really admire what you do. You're such a great storyteller. Your passion for the weather and your work is just infectious. And it has always been a great delight to uh, speak with you and know you, especially this time around. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Mark, it's much, much less stressful than I thought it was going to be. It was like talking to a good friend, a neighbor. Uh, thank you so much for, for helping me along. That's David Phillips. As I mentioned, he is one of my all-time favorite guests because of his infectious enthusiasm and his passion for what he does. I love what David said about avoiding stress and about doing the right things. He really is such an engaging, wonderful, inspiring person. So once again, a huge thank you to David for joining us on Digging Deep. If you enjoyed this episode, please review it and please share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, if you want to see the show notes or subscribe to our weekly newsletter or read my blog, you can do all of that at letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. And get ready for more great stories and powerful lessons on the next edition of Digging Deep. Thank you for listening. <laughs>